Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's nice to see so many of you here today. My name's Karen Luca, and I'm the head of the School of Nursing, Midwifery and Social Work at the University of Manchester. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here uh, at CMFT. Uh, especially to welcome Liz Robb from the Florence Nightingale Foundation. Now these lectures came into being because Jill Heaton and myself, when we were applying for the chair um, sponsored by the foundation, that we would like to, in a sense, reaffirm our commitment to patient safety as being at the heart of care here. And um, this is the second Florence Nightingale lecture. So it gives me great pleasure on Florence Nightingale's birthday, the International Nurses' Day, to welcome Elaine Maxwell. Elaine is currently Principal Lecturer in Leadership at London South Bank University, and she's a non-executive director at Basildon and Thurrock University NHS Hospital Foundation Trust, and that was the first Keogh Trust to come out of special measures. And she is a trustee of the Florence Nightingale Foundation. So it's very fitting that she should be here today to talk about putting safety at the heart of care. Now, after uh, Elaine has spoken to us, there'll be time for questions. So if you could all write your questions down, and uh, then I'll take the questions at the end. So over to you, Elaine. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's a great honour to come and speak to you today, International Nurses' Day. And also, I do know a little bit about some of the work you've done in this trust. Um, I used to work at the Health Foundation, so I know some of the work the Children's Hospital has done on safer clinical systems. So I want to talk today a little bit about some philosophical aspects and some practical aspects of this. And I think putting safety at the heart of care is a pretty universal aspiration. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find any health professional or organisation who didn't want to do that. The challenge, though, is how do we do it, and how do we do that effectively? So the first thing I'd like to ask you is how effective are we? How safe is healthcare in the UK today? And I don't mean in this organisation, I mean in the UK generally. So can we have a show of hands? How many people think healthcare is very safe in the UK? Right, a few. How many people think it's mostly safe? Okay, so that's probably the majority. Any people think that there are some outstanding concerns about safety in healthcare in the UK? Yeah, a few. So, um, a range of views, which is of course what you'd always expect if you ask a group of people what they think about anything. But I do think that one of the issues is that I didn't tell you what I meant by safe. You had your own interpretations of safe. And that's one of the problems talking about safety, is that we don't really say what we mean. And there are a number of different definitions. And I would suggest that depending on the def definition you're working to, your evaluation of safety, but also the actions you take change. So probably the most common definition is absence of harms, although we don't actually say which harms. But it's something about absence of harms. And some people qualify that to absence of avoidable harms. I don't know if you've got the same in this trust, but in, in Basildon and Thurrock, uh, we don't just have a pressure ulcer now. We have a committee of people and the CCG who decide whether it was avoidable. And it's quite interesting for me at the board because I don't know how they decided that. I just know that they did decide it. But moving on from whether it's avoidable or not, you get onto the issue of negligence. And so for some people, and certainly some very angry patient groups, a harm is the result of negligence. And that's quite difficult for health professionals to deal with. So we're starting to look at how a culture is created from the way you look at safety. Some people think that's all too hard, so they move on to compliance with standards. So we've got the evidence base, we can come up with a process, a pathway, checklist. If you follow that, you must be safe. If you use the WHO, checklist in theatre, you must be safe. 
some people look at the management of hazards. They go upstream a bit and say, well, actually, it's OK, come on in. Uh, some people say, well, we should look at hazards. And if we manage the hazards, then actually we'll be safe. But there might be another way of looking at it, which is to stop looking at the absence of anything and look at the presence of something. So if we stopped looking at the absence of harm or failure, what would looking at the presence of safety look like? And so what we have at the moment is a predominant view that we're looking at the absence of harm. And Eric Holnagel is uh, well known to some of you, I'm sure. He's a Danish safety engineer who's moving to look at healthcare as well. And he points out, as a number of other people do, that there's a real paradox that we look at safety by its absence. So we measure the number of cases where we fail to be safe. And we haven't looked at the number of cases where we succeed. And it's probably quite important that we look at where it succeeds as well. Now, I couldn't possibly do this talk without some reference to Florence Nightingale on her birthday and as it's sponsored by the Florence Nightingale Foundation. But measuring harms is useful for understanding what's going on. And Florence, she wasn't quite the first. The first was probably Semmelweis in Vienna looking at puerperal fever. Uh, but she was one of the first people to actually look at the incidence of harm. And that was really groundbreaking stuff. When she was in Crimea looking at what people died of, people thought that young men in the army died of battle wounds. And what you can see here, not awfully well, is her famous coxcomb diagram. So this is a year of deaths from British Army, pers of, uh, British army personnel in, from uh, April... 1854 to March 1855. And she's categorized deaths in three ways. So the orange color is people who've died in battle, from battle wounds. The black color is other causes. We're not quite sure what that is, but it's accidents, fights, drunken, disorderly sort of thing, probably. But the bluey gray color is from disease. And in her day, disease in a hospital was hospital-acquired infection. And what you see there, very dramatically, is the first three months they'd set up the hospitals, people were just dying of other causes. But actually, by the time the hospitals had become established, we're starting to see infection becoming more of a problem. And at every single month after that, the single largest cause of death was, other, was disease, which is essentially infection. Now, it's really important to measure harms in that case because she was producing new knowledge. People really didn't know the extent to which infection was a problem, hospital-acquired infection. And, of course, she was very effective in promoting the idea of infection control, except she would have called it cleanliness. And she had a huge impact on nursing. From her time onwards, there was a huge focus in nursing on cleanliness. So that was a really important use of using, using, measuring harms. And then we go on a little bit. We see 1928, the confidential inquiry into maternal deaths. Again starting to find out why women were dying in pregnancy and childbirth. And they were uncovering new knowledge, which led to new actions, which actually reduced the number of deaths. So there is definitely a place for measuring harm, but is it enough? If we come on a little bit, in more recent times, there are two seminal reports which have affected the way we look at safety management. So the first is To Err as Human by the Institute of Medicine in the USA. That was published in 1999, and they were saying uh, up to 100,000 people every year die in American healthcare due to adverse events. And the following year, the Department of Health published Organization with a Memory, which suggested that in the UK, one in 10 hospital admissions led to some sort of avoidable harm. So we're pretty clear that harm is an issue. The question I'd ask is whether we need to continue measuring it quite as vociferously as we do and whether we need to do something with that information now and do something different. If you look at the response to those two reports, this is um, an interesting uh, report published in 2006 looking at publications after 99 when Two Areas Human came out. And what you see is there was quite a dramatic increase in publications. Um, do this around here. But what's really interesting is the 
the research, the original papers, they went up a little bit, but not a lot. What really went up was editorial letters, reviews, so, so people's opinions. And that does reflect, to some extent, my experience in the UK since then, is a lot of people talk about what we should be doing, but we haven't kept up with the evidence base about what we should be doing, and more importantly, the evaluation of whether what we're doing is effective. There are certain things that are being promoted as self-evident with no evidence. There's really interesting reports come out in the US recently about the amount of money that's been spent on quality improvement in the States and how effective that's been in improving healthcare. And uh, it's a very interesting read. I won't say any more. So in that situation, or in that context, we've then had the Francis report into Midstaffs. And we've also had an expert group led by Don Berwick, ex-president of IHI in Boston, improving the safety of patients in England. So we've had an awful lot of description of what's wrong. But of course, the Francis Report wasn't the first investigation we had into major safety failures in the NHS. We've had a lot of them. And probably the seminal one was the Ely Hospital Report. So Ely Hospital was in Cardiff. And in 1967, the News of the World ran a piece about the scandalous care there and the safety failures. And there was a public inquiry by a QC, Geoffrey Howe, who some of you might recall went on to be a fairly prominent politician. He was Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Foreign Secretary, and then Deputy Prime Minister to Margaret Thatcher. And then we've had other reports since then. We've had South Ockenden in uh, 1972. Some of you might well remember the Bristol investigation, cardiac surgery for children. We then had Maidstone, Tunbridge Wells, C. diff in 2007, Winterbourne View, 2011. And then we're still dealing with the effects of the inquiry into Mid-Staffordshire. And just recently this year, we've had the Kirkup report into maternity services at Morecambe Bay. What's really interesting is if you read them, none of them say anything different. And some people would suggest that Geoffrey Howes was probably the best, and we could probably just bring his out of the cupboard every time there's a scandal and say, here it is. Unlike when Florence Nightingale was counseling harms, where she was telling us something really new, they're not telling us anything we don't already know. They are coming up with pretty much the same findings every time. And whilst it's important for families to have their, their stories heard, there's a real question about whether these inquiries are actually teaching us anything new about how we should be managing safety. And one of the reasons is we spend a lot of time describing the old state. So they're very descriptive, these reports. And we have a little bit of time talking about how things ought to change. And then we might have a slight idea about our vision for the future. But what's really missing is how we're going to do it. And so there's um, you know, a bit of a miracle that happens somewhere in the middle and nobody's quite sure what that involves. So perhaps we need to think about how we're managing safety so that we don't have the same report published in 10 years that says exactly the same things as the Francis report. So that requires us to look at what we're currently doing now. So currently, most people looking at safety, and I know that there are examples in this trust of where you're doing it differently, but largely, People assume that there's a linear cause and effect and a fixed context. So if you can just get back and find the root cause of a given specific failure, which in research terms we might call our independent variable, then you can standardize your interventions around that particular variable, that root cause, and then you'll know you're successful because you'll have fewer occurrences of that particular specific failure. So that's what we do. We have a, a really um, horrendous pressure ulcer. We do a root cause analysis, and we find out why it happened in that case. And we change all our protocols and usually our care plans as well to deal with that particular issue. So that stops that particular error happening again. But it might not stop a slightly different error happening. The other thing, coming back to the comments I was making earlier about culture, if you accept this approach to patient safety, Safety failures are entirely preventable. Any safety error should only happen once. And then, of course, you've got your root cause and you've solved it. And if it does happen, it's due to personal or corporate negligence. 
And that's a recurring discourse around mid-staffs, is that the people there were bad people, people with wrong values, nursing is broken, all these things that people have said, which, which I just don't believe to be true. And more than that, it's not very effective. So Charles Vincent, who some of you may know, is a premier writer and researcher on patient safety in the UK. Um, he published something a long, quite a long time ago now, 2008, where he wanted to look at the effect of to err is human and organisation with a memory. So this is all UK only data, so it's NHS data that's publicly available. And he took 1996 as his base year, and he looked at the instance of various different harms since then. And what's very striking is that their trajectory stayed exactly the same. Those that were reducing reduced before those reports. Those that were increasing increased before those reports. The reports came, and although we had that huge increase in publications, didn't have much impact on the instance of these harms. So what we see is mortality in low-risk groups was falling and continues to fall. Uh, foreign bodies left inside people was falling and continued to fall, and this was before the WHO checklist. What we see is pressure ulcers were increasing and continue to increase, and selected infections were increasing and continue to increase. So around a similar time, we had the National Saving Lives campaign to reduce MRSA bacteremias, and some of you remember that was very successful. I'm sure you all had lots of meetings where you had to count how many you'd had. Um, it's interesting to see that although nationally they did fall, MSSA bacteremias continued to rise, as did GRE bacteremias. So if you measure an individual harm and put attention on it, you know, is that reflective of everything? And also, are these big statement reports and approaches reducing harms? Well, not on that evidence, although it would be interesting to see this data updated to 2015. And one of the reasons for this is James Reason's safety paradoxes. And of course, James Reason is a very esteemed, uh, or was a very esteemed professor of psychology here at Manchester University, who's one of the world's premier thinking on safety. And a lot of you will recognize this picture as the Swiss cheese model. Um, I think it has lost something in translation in the NHS, because the point he was trying to make is there's a very tenuous link between safety and harm. And therefore, measuring harms as a way of evaluating safety is not very effective. So you have this linear approach, and so the view is that you just go and close up all those holes. But of course, if you close up, close up those holes, then you could have them going through different holes. And it doesn't have to be linear. They can go around in circles. And the idea that you could identify all the holes and close them all it's probably a bit unrealistic. It's probably an infinite number of holes, and you couldn't plan in advance to close them all and therefore ensure that this wouldn't happen. So I'd like to suggest that measuring harms as a way of protecting how, predicting how safe your, car, your care is is like a game of Russian roulette. The fact that the five patients before me didn't get shot does not in any way reduce my risk, because the bullet's there, it was always there. It's just you didn't know it was there, and I didn't know it was there. So some of the problems that we have in safety are the things we don't know about. The things we don't know about, we can't plan for or mitigate for. So, is there a different way of doing this? Well, I think there probably is. So if instead of taking the idea that we can plan everything and it's a linear approach, if we accept that healthcare is socio-technical and we focus on the socio bits as well as the technical, and that conditions of work are underspecified, we don't know how things happen. Things change. We work in a very complex environment, and they're very variable. So the idea that you could plan the perfect pathway just isn't realistic. So what happens in safety failures is that we have multifactorial nonlinear events. So a checklist isn't going to be that helpful in those circumstances. Safety failures in this philosophy are due to a lack of awareness of what's coming up and or inability to adapt to changing environments. 
So if we looked at that, rather than defining safety as the absence of harm, we would identify it as the presence of something, the ability to succeed under expected and unexpected conditions alike, so that the number of intended and acceptable outcomes is as high as possible. So to paraphrase that, safety is the capacity to ensure reliable outcomes in varying circumstances. And it is that variability, that complexity and unpredictability that is the key issue. So some of you might have heard about high reliability organisations. So Vike and Sutcliffe were looking at safety in a number of industries. And they noted that some industries were inherently very high risk, but didn't seem to have a lot of safety failures. So they looked at nuclear, they looked at oil, they looked at rail, shipping, and the blessed aviation. Although most of their learning came from oil and nuclear. And they found that there are very, very high risk situations, lots of complexity, lots of variability, but actually surprisingly low rates of failure. When they fail, they're catastrophic, but actually they're much lower as a rate of incidence than you get in healthcare. So they studied these organizations and they identified five domains that, in, that were making them safe. So sensitivity to operations, Actual awareness in real time. Because things are unpredictable, you have to know in real time what's going on. The fact that you know what happened last week or last month is not very helpful. Preoccupation with failure. They expect to fail, so they think about it. So they're encouraged to say, how could this fail? What could happen? What really wacky thing? What, what would happen if a meteorite fell out of space on this hospital? And so they're actually thinking about what might happen. Some things are likely to happen, things, some things are unlikely, but they think about them all. Really importantly, they defer to expertise. And I'm going to come on to this later, the, the, the challenge of deferring to expertise and standardization. But they are very clear that they do routine work when they need to, but they very quickly defer to expertise. I don't know how many of you remember the plane that landed on the River Hudson. Captain Sullenberger he took off and uh, he lost one engine, then he lost the other. And it's really interesting, listen to the transcript of air traffic control, because they're trying to encourage him to follow all the protocols. And he just ignores them all, because <laughs> he's a really experienced pilot. And in that situation, for which there was not a protocol, there is no protocol for landing on rivers in North America. But he just said, I'm here, I know what's going on, I'm going to do what my expertise tells me the right thing to do is. They landed it and no lives were lost. And everything thinks that's incredible. And the reason it's incredible is because he didn't follow any protocols. Resilience, the ability to adapt to changing circumstances, having a plan B. Things, if you work in a very complex and unproductable environment, you've got to have a plan B. And you need two types of resilience. You need personal resilience. You need to be able to be resilient when you come into work and half the staff aren't there and half the resources you were looking for weren't there and you've been told that you know, you've, you've got to make beds because there's 523 people waiting in A&E. You need some personal resilience. But you need system resilience as well. The system has got to be able to have a plan B and do things differently because you work as part of a system and a reluctance to simplify. So things cannot be reduced to a single linear approach. So checklists, useful, but they shouldn't be taken as the definitive way of doing things. They're a way of prompting your thinking. But if you use them as, a, as the absolute, then you're simplifying everything and potentially you're gonna have more problems. So going through those and what that might mean for the health service and nursing. Sensitivity to operations, you need unbiased real-time information. So the human brain can only cope with so much information. So we filter things out, not because we're bad people, but because we are people. And we've got so much capacity, electronic now, to gather data and present things visually, that we should be getting as much information as we can in real time about how the operations of what we're doing are varying. So we might be going slower than we expected. We might be going faster than we expected. We also need to understand how the environment is changing. So are you getting different case mix of patients? Is the weather affecting it? 
all these things about your workload that you should know on a minute by minute basis. Some of you might know um, the, the project that Birmingham Children's Hospital did with Formula One, where they were taking data about children in ITU and predicting what was going to happen in the next few minutes, and they were trying to get it out to half an hour so they could predict a cardiac arrest and prevent it. In the same way, air traffic control for England now has a way of modelling what's going to happen in airspace in the next 10 minutes. So if you're an air traffic controller, you've got data about what's happening in real time. You've actually also got a computer model of what's going to happen in 10 minutes' time if you don't do anything. So you will see that these planes are going to crash because one is going slightly off course before you actually realise it yourself. And also constant awareness of the outcomes. So for nursing, it may be, do you, do you know how many non-blanching erythemas there are on your ward today? Or are you working on data about how many grade two, three, and four pressure ulcers you had last week? And the same with, with ulcers, do you, uh, with falls. Do you know how many non-injurious falls you've had since midnight? Or are you relying on historical data about what happened last week, last month? The preoccupation with failure. Well, again, we have the IT technology to model things. We can put lots of data into a computer model and say, what happens if I change just one aspect of this? So in high reliability organizations, staff are encouraged to come up with the most weirdy, wackiest things that might never happen, and encouraged to go and use a computer model to see what would happen and what would happen if you just change things slightly. So you could model into that if you had the data. What would happen if we increased the educational level of the nurses on the ward but reduced the number of them? And what would happen if we increased the number of staff but reduced the educational level? All these sort of things you could model in advance. It's also really important when you're thinking about failure to look at a 360 degree view. If you ask patients what safety is, they've usually got a very different view from health professionals. So getting that whole view Look, helps you make sure that nothing falls between two stools. And understanding the concept of loosely coupled failure. So this is a term from engineering, and it's about the directness of the link between a cause and effect. So if you're a surgeon and uh, you cut off the wrong leg, that's a pretty immediate harm, and you can see it fairly clearly. But for nurses, one of the problems with actually getting safety measures for nurses is that most of the harms or the safety failures are loosely coupled failures. You do something and it isn't for some time that you see an effect and you're not sure that you could pin it exactly on the nursing contribution. But we are starting to understand more. So there's a lot of work about patients feeling safe. We know that if patients don't feel safe, they won't mobilize. They're, le they're more likely to have a longer length of stay. If they have a longer length of stay, they're more likely to have an infection or a pressure ulcer. But probably more importantly than that, with elderly patients, if they lose their confidence, they might not go back home to their own independent living. We know that admission is a major tr trigger for admission to residential or nursing care. So if there's something about making the patients feel safe, it could have a very direct effect on their outcomes. And same with medication compliance. There's some really interesting uh, work that's been done about the percentage of patients who are taking medications as prescribed two weeks after discharge. And some people say it's only about 24% of patients who are still taking it as prescribed at that time. So the way in which nurses are interacting with patients in hospital can have a huge impact on their compliance with their medication. Conversely, we don't comply with the medication regime they've produced. So classically, people with Parkinson's are admitted to acute hospitals. First thing we do is take the medications away, tell them we're going to give it when it suits us. They lose their mobility, they fall over, and they have an injurious fracture. These are not tightly coupled, but they're probably more important for nursing. And modeling that preoccupation with what would happen if we did that would create safety. Deference to expertise, so this is my second quote from Florence of the day. Uh, she writes some great stuff. You, she said, it is as impossible in a book to teach a person in charge of the sick how to manage as it is to teach her how to nurse. Circumstances must vary with each different case, but it is possible to press upon her 
to think for herself. So one of the single most important things we can do to create safety is to ensure that we have critical thinking and make sure that all our nurses are independent, critical thinkers. Resilience, coping with the unexpected. So I've said already, that's about having a plan B, having an option for when there is a safety failure. That's both having a plan off the shelf. So we're quite good. We've got an emergency plan for a major disaster. But there are some things that are more likely to go wrong than others. And you could have a plan B that had been written in advance. But we also have to give people permission so when something really strange happens on, on your area, your organization has to have the confidence to give you the permission as this critical thinking person to do something different. And that's something organizations have to think about. One of the ways you do that is you make sure there are clear principles and priorities to guide practice. So one of the things that happens if you write everything down and tell everybody what to do is if they have to do something different, they don't know what the priority is. So at least tell them what the priorities are. And if we've created these critical thinking nurses, they should be able to apply principles to practice rather than just be told what the practice should be. So organizations need to be very clear about the principles and priorities to enable nurses to think critically. And we need to make sure there's a very clear alignment between espoused values and operational practice. So if safety really is at the heart of things, does that mean you can stop the line? This is one of the famous things about the Toyota production method, is that if anybody in the organization thinks that things don't work, they can say stop the line. I'm not sure how much that happens in the NHS. People talk about it. What they do in Toyota, though, is and if you stop the line, a senior executive comes down straight away. So you don't just stop the line and fill in an instant form. Somebody very senior comes down and either decides to restart the line immediately or to take action. So there's quite a lot for organizations to think about the way they practice operationally. And I don't think many places, you may correct me if you do it here, actually do that at the moment. And finally, re reluctance to simplify. So some of you may know the work of uh, Mary Dixon Woods, who's done a lot of work evaluating uh, improvement projects, uh, both in this country and beyond. She works at Leicester University. And she evaluated Matching Michigan, which was an MPSA program to bring the work in the state of Michigan to reduce central line infections. Um, she's written a lot of interesting things about that program. But this really interesting report that was in Millbank Quarterly showed that actually Human factors even come into counting things. So she looked at how they counted central line infections, and she found that it wasn't standard at all. It wasn't straightforward. People in big teaching hospitals had access to much more microbiology. There would, might be 24-hour microbiology. There were certainly more assay tests available. People in big teaching trusts like this might have an audit nurse whose only job is to collect this. So you've got the same person collecting it every time. So if you've got an error, at least it's an inbuilt error. Whereas in smaller DGHs, it's the nurse who's on duty. And it might be a different person every shift who's counting this. And it's a social process measuring, even something as apparently straightforward as a central line infection. So reducing everything to a very simple measure is fraught with difficulty because humans are doing the measuring. So the implications of high reliability for nursing I need to come on really to the idea of variation because there is a school of thought that says that variation is a bad thing, that what we're doing is striving to avoid variation. But that's not entirely true and that's certainly not what happens in lean industry, certainly not what happens in Toyota. Variation is permitted but only where it's patient driven and highly justified. So it shouldn't vary because of random inability of the system to do it. We shouldn't say we're not going to follow this practice because today we haven't got the resources to do it. It shouldn't be staff preferences. It shouldn't be that's not how we do it on this ward. It's not how this consultant likes it done. It shouldn't be any form of arbitrary decision making. And it shouldn't be business or, or finance. So that brings us to the issue about what are the advantages of standardization versus individualization of care. And of course, we do want to be evidence-based. So we need to define what the ideal standard process is from the evidence base. 
And that's our first problem, because there isn't always an evidence base. But let's assume there is. What you're going to produce is an abstract standard. It's not going to be applied in all different circumstances in the same way. You should, however, practice to the standard, to the evidence base, unless and until you find that there's a patient-driven variance needed. And that, of course, requires experts. You do need these expert critical thinkers to decide when this variation is required. But to have people never make this variation is as dangerous as to not have them standardize the care. And you need to measure the amount of variation so you understand what's going on. And there's two things you're looking for. One is whether the variation is intentional or not intentional. Because clearly you can't support unintentional variation, things that just happen randomly and be, they're different for random reasons, and those that you've actively chosen to. The other thing you need to look at, and those of you who know your shoe art and your SPC charts, is you need to look at special cause variation and common cause variation. So special cause variation is when there's a change in the circumstances. You see a stepwise change, and that usually means something external has happened to change things. And your intention is to reduce unintended variation, but to absolutely celebrate and promote intended, justified, patient-driven variation. So, of course, that requires you to have some thought about and some review about the extent of variation rather than just your SPC chart. Your SPC chart only tells you if there was variation. It doesn't tell you why there was variation. If we find that there is a lot of variation in practice that isn't justified for patient needs, then either we don't know what to do, which means we need to do more research, and certainly despite the best efforts of our pioneering nursing universities, and Manchester's been at the forefront of nursing academia in the UK, there's still a lot of things that we don't actually have a research base for. Or we do know what to do, but we aren't doing it, and we need to look at the extent to which we understand quality improvement measures beyond standardizing things and measuring harms. Because there is a whole science behind this. Uh, I saw somebody tweet something um, about a report about people weren't following PDSA, PDSA cycles. And I was thinking, so what? PDSA is not improvement science. It is one tool of improvement science. So if we were to measure safety rather than harm, then I think there are a few principles we'd look at. Firstly, it'd be prospective and predictive, not historical. We've collected the data about past harms for so long now that we pretty much know what the harm rates are and what the risks of healthcare are. What we need is to collect data going forward, and it needs to be in real time. The other thing we need to do is we need to look at continuous data and not episodic. We need to look for trends. Looking for meeting targets isn't particularly helpful. So mid-staffs, was in the upper quartile on a number of quality indicators, and for a few years it was on a very clear decline. But it was still above average, because it started in the upper quartile, and so it didn't ring any alarm bells. So looking at past fail of a target isn't particularly helpful for predicting what's going to happen in the future. We probably need to look at asset-based rather than deficit-based approaches to measuring safety. What went well? What do we want to do more of? And certainly in terms of engaging staff and motivating them, if you say that was brilliant, could you do more of that? And could you tell us how you did that and share that? That's going to engage and make staff want to work harder than if you tell them you did that wrong and could you please stop doing it? We would need to measure the system capacity for responsiveness. If we take the premise that actually healthcare is complex, and unpredictable, you need to have that responsiveness so we can measure the flexibility of the response of the organisation and whether it's a learning organisation. We talk about that, but how often do we ever measure it? We'd have to look at how much our staff were thinking critically and how much they were justifying their variation. So at the moment we have SPC charts and safety thermometer and whatever, but we don't actually look at the extent to which people are varying intentionally, and we don't look at whether that's justified, or at least not in the organisations I work in. And one of the challenges about measuring safety, one of the things that people would say to me is, if you don't measure harms, what do you measure? It's difficult to measure safety because you can't empirically, objectively quantify it. 
But we know that confidence is a really important indicator. Most of you know the moment you walk onto a clinical area whether you think it's safe, and most of your pa patients do as well. And there's been work to correlate harms with both patient and staff surveys. And there is a school of thought that says the only thing you have to measure is patient and staff satisfaction, because if it's high, you'll have high quality. And the other thing that's quite interesting about the way we measure safety at the moment is we take a single data source. And we should be looking at things from a 360 degree. We should be triangulating our data. This is an important issue for us. So we need to get data from a number of different sources and say, do they all tell us the same story? And we need to look at the range as well as the mean. We often report things as means. In the, in the trust, this is no secret because it's in our public board papers, but at Basel and Thurrock, they kept reporting that our pressure oscillator rate was fine and it was uh, at the average. And I kept saying, so why if we had 14 grade three pressure ulcers? I'm sure this is not right. Our mean was fine, but we were skewed towards grade three and grade four, and that wasn't picked up in the mean averaging. And that might be an issue for some of the issues around the safety thermometer. So, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elaine, for that uh, very provocative talk. I'm sure that um, there will be some questions. So I'm happy to take questions if uh, somebody will be brave enough to ask the first one. Thank you. Oh, sorry, thank you. Hi. Hi, Sarah Ingleby, uh, acute care and hospital at night here. Um, I have thought the thing, uh, the, the discussion around the feeling safe for the patients was fantastic, and I haven't seen a lot about that in, in the, the literature that, I, that I've been reading. But I would be interested to know sort of more about that. Is there anything more that we can do or should be doing or that, that would make them feel safer. I mean, I kind of can think of stuff on the top of my head, but what does the research say? You can use this one if there's a... Oh, that's it. Yes, the light is on. <laughs> Come over here. That'll um, be more efficient. There are people looking at it. So Bradford Teaching Hospitals has been doing some work on this so with the university. And they've developed a way of getting patients to assess safety, including how they're feeling. But the difficulty is the things that we measure tend to be physical, whereas patients, it's more about feeling. And so measuring quite different dimensions. I, I did quote there um, Scott, who, who looked at patients who called uh, for an ambulance, did some really interesting work with uh, Yorkshire, is it West Yorkshire? Yorkshire Ambulance Trust, anyhow. And um, he has produced something that the Ambulance Trust uses now, which is a visual rep representation, a bit like a, a pain thermometer, where it asks people how they're feeling. And what they've discovered is that if they actually ask people about their feeling of safety, they can put different interventions in. So the ambulance paramedics turn up and they think this doesn't need acute hospital care. But the family and the patient are really anxious. So you know the default position is to take them to A&E and A&E can sort them out. But if they can use this scale and find out that actually they don't feel safe, they can start to have that discussion about why don't you feel safe and what other sort of interventions could we put in place. A lot of people come to hospital because they think it's a place of safety rather than because they need clinical interventions. And so the Ambulance Trust has been working with social services and they have um, a number of responders who, they, who the paramedics can call out and say, I've come to this home, I don't think this person needs to go to hospital, but they do need somebody to come and talk to them. Thank you. Um, Other questions? The, in regards to the quality improvement program that you have on the wards and the standardisation, what have you found anything from the patient experience tracker um, that's kind of been a bit of a trend, maybe positive or negative, on what it is? And then, if you can look at the other perspective from the staff's point of view and the clinical perspective, is there anything that's been flagged up from that that you can kind of look at too from the patient and the ward perspective. I don't know, improvement, that's what I'm looking for. 
What have you found any key improvement areas from either the patient perspective or the ward or theatre, wherever you work? While you're thinking about that, I think you've got a lot of data. So we say this all the time. The NHS is washed with data that we do absolutely nothing with. So you could be triangulating it in that data. You've got a lot of data about patient satisfaction down to ward level. You've got your PALS. You've got your complaints. You've got your staff survey. You've got your harm, however you measure it. You've ever got other stuff. I know Sarah's been doing a, a lot of stuff on risks. Have you ever put all that data together? and say, what does that show us about this clinical area, this ward? You could triangulate from the data you've got now, but it's not the way we do things. Hi, um, thank you very much. That's a really good presentation. I'm Sarah Cork. I'm the Director of Clinical Governance here, um, and somewhat obsessed with measurements in many ways. I've been doing <laughs> it for a long time. Um, Firstly, yes, we are starting to do some of that, and certainly through the programme of quality reviews that the nursing teams have been very heavily involved with, we've been putting all of that together to tell the story of our divisions. What I suspect we're not doing as well is doing that at, very, at a more micro level, at, at ward and department level, and I think doing some of that with teams, I think, is, is certainly a really good idea, and I know some of that's being done already, but I think building upon that, I think, would be a really good thing to do. Um, I have a question for you. Um, one of our popular measurements, certainly in the nursing world, is it's been X days since our last Y. Yeah. Um, do you see that as a prospective measure, as a retrospective measure? Arguably, it's a positive statement, so it's been X days since uh, a harm has occurred. Do you see that as looking forward, looking backwards, a bit of both, um, useful? Well... There are various, you know, as you know, there are a lot of people who have different views on that. Some people say it makes it harder to report things. So we went through a whole phase of telling people to report any incident because we thought there was fear. I have seen some people do some small studies to say, if you're the one who's reporting the first pressure ulcer in a year, the whole world will descend on you. So is that a disincentive? So given that measurement is a social process, the idea that measuring infections or pressure ulcers is entirely objective is just not true. So would it make you disinclined to describe this as a pressure ulcer if there was some other way? So people have great discussions about whether um, nasal uh, ulcers are pressure ulcers, and there's, there's all sorts of ways why people's counting goes down. In terms of do I think it's prospective, um, that, that's a difficult one, but it, I, I go back to this thing about the uh, Russian roulette. You know, if I am the first person in the year to have a pressure ulcer, I don't care that nobody else did last year. You know, I've still got that pressure area. And it, it depends on your philosophical starting point. If your philosophical starting point is that it's a very complex, unpredictable environment, today might be very different from yesterday. So the fact that you haven't had any pressure ulcers for the last year is only important if absolutely nothing has changed in that context. But if you're two staff down, if the trust is reorganized and you've got a different case mix of patient, then actually it's not good at predicting whether I'll get a pressure ulcer today. I think it, it, it's, my personal view, it's an important measure as part of a story, a story of or a journey, a story those words can be used interchangeably. Where were we? Where are we now? And where are we going? Well, obviously, I'm taking a fairly um, extreme point to, to uh, generate a debate, so I'm not saying that we shouldn't measure anything. Uh, but is it predictive? Probably not, unless you can tell me that absolutely nothing changed in that ward. There's nothing at all different today from the last year. Then I don't think it's predictive, and I don't think you could tell me that there was absolutely nothing different on the ward today. So I would much rather see a high reliability organisations so that the nurse on that ward today can say, actually, there's something different today, and we need to do something to different to safeguard our patients rather than go, we're fine, we don't have pressure ulcers. Which I have heard people say. I think, oh. Other questions? David. Hi, David Olsop from uh, University of Manchester. Um, I'm interested in linking what you're saying about uh, the, this need for a new approach to uh, 
leadership and what sort of leadership might be needed to promote this sort of thing. And I appreciate this is not an easy sort of route to take, but I'm thinking that there seems to be a way forward here and think of linking this to uh, Riddle and Weber's work on Tame Wicked and Critical Problems. Maybe you're aware yes. of that. And, yeah, I am. And this seems to fit with the, with the wicked conceptualization of problems. Yeah. And given the sort of complexity of the, of the situations that people are working in these days, that what is needed is good leadership, not necessarily, but we need good management, but we need good leadership because yeah. It's that approach that will uh, help people to think through collaboratively what sort of solutions are needed to these, to these safety problems. I think that's true at the organisational level. So yes, it's at, you know, quality improvement safety is absolutely a wicked problem in that definition. And you do need corporate leadership to create the conditions in which local staff can do things. But safety happens at the interface between practitioners and patients. And um, so you, you will see that I'm a principal lecturer in leadership, uh, and I cry every when we start the course, and people tell me they want to be a transformational leader. I just want to shoot myself and go home at that point. <laughs> uh, because we're quite, we've got some fashions in leadership. And yes, it will be important to create the conditions that allow our critical thinking nurses to create the variation when it's needed how that fits in with the current rhetoric about leadership, I think we'd, we'd have to look at um, the followership models of leadership rather than the... I, I, I still have a problem with some of the transformational leadership models being about a superstar who's going to lead us all out of the desert. We can't have, can't have transformation leaders everywhere, can we? We'd be... Overwhelmed with transformation, wouldn't they? Exactly, exactly. And I, I think it's about empowering the people who have contact with patients. And again, if you look at the high reliability organisations, yes, they do have corporate leaders who are usually not experts in the field. So they'll have people leading the strategy for the business, but they will be absolutely clear that the engineer does what they think is right on the day. And so... The function of leadership is to create the conditions for people to do what's right, rather than to tell people what they should do. Thank you. That last question Thank you. There is one. Oh. Fittingly, from the Golly, didn't mean it to be the last question. Thank you so much, Elaine. That was um, absolutely fascinating. I wondered if. There was a link here to professional judgment. I mean, you used the case of the pilot, the highly experienced pilot, telling air traffic control, who kept telling him to land on a field, to turn left and go to the nearest mm -hmm. airport, which he knew he couldn't get to. And he just knew, because he was trained, he was experienced. One of the things that is an issue is we decry nursing professional judgment as not being of value. Um, particularly around models of care, what the numbers should be, how many nurses should be on wards. You know, we want tools all the time that replace it, and we have lost our sense of value for a body of knowledge and judgment that uses our expertise and our knowledge. Would you have any comment about that? Yes, and, and I do agree, but of course the challenge is, how do you distinguish the experts from the also-ran? Because time served doesn't mean you're an expert. And I think we could go back to Dreyfus and Dreyfus' skills acquisition model, which was the basis of Pat Benner's um, book, Novice to Expert, which says that expertise and intuition are not some sort of mystical things that you were born with. It is a function from having your theory and your practice and using critical thinking to apply both. So I think that we should be able to describe professional judgment better than we do. We use it as a cop-out sometimes as nurses, so it's been used a lot to, in the nurse staffing debate. Oh, you couldn't possibly use any data. We'll just use professional judgment. And you think, well, no, actually, professional judgment would look at the data and then look at the context and, using critical thinking, decide what they thought was safe and justify how they'd got there. So as long as nurses justify how they get to their professional judgment. Sue Ward is going to have the final say and conclude for us. Thank you, Karen.
this has to come down now to my, to my height. Um, and thank you, Elaine, for um, a very uh, thought-provoking and excellent lecture. And what could be more apt uh, for International Nurses Day um, than a Florence Nightingale Foundation lecture focused on our role in keeping our patients safe? Um, and patient safety is at the heart of our um, new professional code. Um, and that requires us to preserve safety, so very relevant to the changes in nursing. Um, and it gives us a whole list of things that we should be doing to preserve safety. We should work within the limits of our competence. We should be open even when things have gone wrong. We should always offer to help. Um, we should act without delay. We should raise concerns if we think, excuse me, our patients aren't receiving care. Um, and we should be focused on reducing harm. It feels to me there might be something we should be adding to that list after listening to um, Elaine's lecture today. And, and I suppose just a reminder to ourselves that here at CMFT, quality and safety are central to our trust vision and our commitments. Uh, and over, our re over recent years, we've established the harm-free care systems um, and we, we look at things like falls and pressure ulcers and infections. Um, and Elaine's really challenged us today to look at our systems, not just to look at the absence of harm, but to focus on the presence of safety. So that's food for thought for us to take away. I think one of the positives that I hope we can hold on to is that we do measure in the moment. We don't do point prevalence surveys. We do in the moment so that we do have that focus on what's happening. Um, and it's interesting because Elaine's highlighted a, a range of reports that have been produced over the years that repeat the same findings. So there's a clear message from today, I think, that we need to focus on the, the how, not the what. So that feels like something we need to take away from today. And for me, there's a really important message as well that's around balancing standardization and policies and protocols and checklists and tick lists. Uh, and we all have our risk assessment documents and all of that that we fill in, don't we? Um, but we need to balance that with the, the appropriate response to varying circumstances. And, and that means that that response that in that response we as nurses need to apply a well-developed knowledge that's based on evidence we need to be able to challenge we need to bring our professional judgment not just rely on the checklist but to know when the checklist isn't the right thing to use as well and we need to know what's happening today this minute and to be able to act and use our knowledge and judgment to respond to that minute applying our critical thinking so i'd really challenge you to Reflect on Elaine's lecture today, and that could be part of your revalidation evidence, of course. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> Andrea will be proud of me. Um, and to think about what you might change in your practice um, after hearing uh, what Elaine said to us today, to ensure that you personally go away and take your role in keeping our patients safe. So really, just to conclude, uh, a few thank yous. I think a thank you to our own um, Florence Nightingale Foundation Chair, Professor Angela Todd, um, and um, to Liz Robb, the Chief Exec of Florence Nightingale Foundation, who's traveled up to be with us today um, uh, and has got to get the 25 past four train back to London. <laughs> but also to Tim Twelvetree, who's done a lot of work behind the scenes in um, getting today's uh, lecture set up. So thank you, Tim. Um, uh, and of course, a huge thank you to Elaine for coming and sharing her work and her thinking with us uh, and setting some challenge into the system that we'll take away and work on. Uh, and finally, a thank you to everyone that's attended today. Thank you for attending, um, but thank you for the work that you do as nurses day in, day out. Um, it's it's an International Nurses Day. It's appropriate that we should recognise the work of nurses uh, and just take the opportunity to say thank you for everything that you do uh, to make a difference to patient safety every day. So thank you very much. Thank you.